Shalom Aleichem. I'm Susan Bronson, Executive Director of the Yiddish Book Center. It is my great pleasure to welcome you today for this special program celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Wexler Oral History Project. The project was launched and has been directed since its inception by Krista Whitney. Krista came to the center first as a summer student in our Steiner Summer Yiddish program, and later as a recent graduate of Smith College to become one of our inaugural fellows. Krista had the idea that the center should start collecting oral histories. She learned every aspect of the endeavor and has truly created a collection of incalculable value and importance. From the start, she understood and emphasized that we should not simply record the stories, but that we had to put a focus equally on preserving the stories and making them accessible. Since those early days, she and a small team of volunteers and field fellows have to date collected 1,088 oral histories and counting from individuals across six continents and at least seven different languages. Yiddish, of course, but also Spanish, Polish, and more. She's interviewed some famous people. The interview with Leonard Nimoy has been viewed more than 860,000 times. But even more importantly, she's interviewed well-known Yiddish writers and cultural figures and their descendants and the stories of ordinary people. The numbers tell us that these interviews are being accessed at an astounding rate. More than 400,000 views of full interviews and more than 6 million views of interview excerpts on YouTube. But the numbers can't convey the historical significance of this project. These interviews provide a deeper understanding of the Jewish experience and the legacy and changing nature of Yiddish language and culture. Used by scholars, students, filmmakers, journalists, Yiddish language teachers, and simply enjoyed by so many more, this collection will indeed have an important and lasting impact for generations to come. In addition to Krista's extraordinary work, this project would not be possible without the generous support of Deborah and Peter Wexler, who believed in the project from the start. I think they're with us virtually today, and I hope they know how truly grateful we are. Before we begin the presentation, just a reminder that you can post questions in the Q&A and we'll do our best to get to them all at the end of the program. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce Krista Whitney. Krista? Hello, Shalom Aleichem. Thanks so much, Susan, for that introduction. Um, I want to echo uh, Susan's thanks uh, to Deborah and Peter Wexler. Thank you so much for believing in the project in the beginning and uh, for your continued support. We couldn't do it without you. And Deborah, your um, your passion for for this uh, this work for public history has been an inspiration to me over this decade. Wow, a decade! <laughs> I can't believe we're here. Um, before I start, I do want to um, say a few more thanks. Um, in addition to Deborah and Peter Wexler, there have been many others who have generously contributed to support our work. So I thank each and every one of you for your contributions. Enormous thanks to Aaron Lansky and Susan Bronson for, for supporting me and for making space for oral history at the Yiddish Book Center. Thank you to many colleagues and collaborators uh, uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. And I also just want to add a personal thanks to my Nana, to my grandmother, who taught me the rich rewards that come with deep listening. All right, I'm going to share my screen here. So today is a celebration of a decade of the Yiddish Book Center's Wexler Oral History Project. But really, it's a celebration of these of stories and of, in particular, the over 1000 people who have been so generous to give their time and um, allow us to record their uh, personal experiences of um, their life stories really, literally the, the collection would not exist with each, with all of you. And I know some people who have participated in the project are with us today. So um, thank you so much. And I, I wanna dedicate the, uh, the, pre, the celebration today to uh, those who's, who have given stories to the Yiddish Book Center and who have since passed away. So I thought it would be uh, worth starting with a bit of background. Um, 
So founded the, the Yiddish Book Center's Wexler Oral History Project was founded in 2010 um, with an idea to collect Jewish stories. Stories have been a part of the Yiddish Book Center for all of its 40 year existence. They are inside the uh, over 1 million Yiddish books we've collected um, and they surround them as well. If any of you have read the memoir Outwitting History uh, written by Aaron Lansky, the Yiddish Book Center's founder and president about the early years, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about, that stories surround uh, uh, the books that we've collected and they represent a, um, a culture that goes beyond what has been written. So when the project started out, uh, we kind of looked around and said, okay, what, what is going on already in the landscape of Jewish oral history? And we noticed that much of what uh, was being recorded, rightly so, was Holocaust testimony. So because that has been so well documented, we decided not to focus on a particular historical event but rather to focus on Yiddish language and culture. Um, and so we've done this in a, a many ways, as Susan mentioned earlier, we've interviewed all kinds of people, um, well-known people, many people lesser well-known about um, their lives and interaction with the Yiddish language and culture. The big question we've been trying to answer um, really and, and are continuing to answer uh, through the interviews that we, we are conducting ongoing is what was and is the place of Yiddish culture in Jewish life and in the broader societal context. So as I said, we interview people with, uh, of all kinds, um, people of all ages and backgrounds to try to understand that, uh, that question. We re record interviews in Yiddish whenever possible. And I've really tried uh, through this collection to build a collection that is representative of Yiddish culture outside the ultra-Orthodox world. That may sound a little crazy starting a project in 2010 and trying to be representative. Of course, there are the limitations of, of uh, our time. You know, starting in, in 2010, we only had could only reach back so far in living memory. Um, but it has been my goal to, to as we go on, uh, uh, develop a collection that will be a resource um, to, to future generations about um, Yiddish culture in, in the 20th and, and 21st century. So before I get to show you some stories, I wanted to take a moment to say, to talk about why do this work? Um, I believe that stories are humanity. Storytelling is the oldest form of creating and transmitting culture and history. And I truly believe that it's only through a mosaic of individual pr perspectives that we can approximate an understanding of collective human experience of history. And as I learned, thanks to the wonderful tutelage of my colleague and mentor, Dr. Jane Guberman, oral history is also a modern academic field with a methodology that helps to create interviews that are themselves archival documents. I want to say thank you so much to Jane, who was instrumental in setting up this, the structure of the project in the first several years and on a more personal note, talked me through many challenges in those early years when I was trying to navigate how, what work was and what oral history was and how to, um, how to build this all. So thank you, Jane. And thank you um, to another important mentor, Hank Isnetsky, who balanced Jane's methodical approach with a push to just get out there and start asking the questions. So thank you to you both. So uh, I wanted to start by taking you back to 2010. Um, when we started out the project, we started close to home. We set up a recording studio at the Yiddish Book Center and started interviewing members of our local community 
and people who visited the Yiddish Book Center. So I want to start out with actually a clip from our very first interview. Um, this interview was conducted by Aaron Lansky um, with a longtime volunteer of the, at the Yiddish Book Center. Um, Fran sat at the front desk for many years, welcoming people to the Yiddish Book Center. And I also want to start out with this clip because there's a bit of a connection to, uh, to the upcoming holiday, Hanukkah, that's, that's coming up this week. And um, I love uh, the connection to, um, you know, very important media through which culture is maintained and transmitted culinary tradition. So let's hear um, this clip from Fran. In, in my father's, my paternal grandmother's house, the frying pan was always on with latkes. It didn't have to be Hanukkah, but whoever would come in, there was always latkes on the stove. My grandfather loved them, and she made them all the time. That was his concession to Jewish food. My mother was a wonderful cook. It's going to sound awful, but she used to make tzinglach. That's little calf's tongues. She used to make them sweet and sour. And it sounds awful, but it was delicious. And, and also, don't laugh, and maybe you're going to have to cut it out. I don't know. She used to make brains. And um, she used to cook them, just boil them, really. Calves, calves, calves brains. Yeah, the little one. Um, and I remember, oh God, we used to have them with schmaltz and with onion. Oh, I don't know anybody that's going to hear this or see this is going to say, what in heaven's name is she talking about? But I think anybody that grew up, um, my mother used to make all of that stuff, milt, which, which was spleen, and she used to stuff it with, with uh, grated potatoes. These were things that I would love, but you know, then, then the, the, um, the government said, you can't eat the organs, and, and they took a lot of it off the market. Tongue you can still get in the in the um, in the delicatessen you can still get, but that's the large you know the uh, this was the, this is my food you know uh, my ethnicity my my ethnic foods um, and then I think she made them because they were a cheaper cut of meat and what we could afford that's what we had my uh, my children also developed a taste for that my son and my daughter. And my grandchildren now are, are, are doing that because my daughter brings that. When she goes to Albany, she shops at the Jewish markets in Albany and brings stuff back. So they've learned, um, you know, tongue is, is, is good. That's good stuff, good Jewish stuff. In, in my... So we knew right away that, that part of the value of these stories was historical. Um, for a myriad of political, historical, and social reasons, Yiddish has not always been a part of the story told about American Jews and about of Jewish history more broadly. So one of the goals that, um, you know, one of the things that we've been doing through these interviews is reaching back in time through living memory and the family stories passed down to those we've interviewed to the heyday of Yiddish as one of a multicultural, multilingual society that existed with all of its problems, of course, in Eastern Europe for about a thousand years leading up to World War II. Um, and we, we try, we, you know, there's a sense of urgency to try to document what we can um, uh, from elders about a Jewish world of mostly Yiddish speaking Jews that was almost entirely destroyed. So I want to start with, um, I, I mean, I want to show you next a couple of clips um, that reach back to Eastern Europe. So first of all, here we have the, an art historian, Adina Gordon. My mother described the pogrom of 1909 where they went running into the cellar of the house. 
and the Kazakhs came through and threw everything about in the house. The mother said they came up from the basement and Baba started yelling, Ganovim, Ganovim, Admigigamvit, the guns all the Sachen. And she did not, she was distraught, because I shall tell you why mainly, what was important to her. But in order to vent her rage, she went to the local priest. And she said to them, how could you let the people do this? And he said it was the Cossacks. And she said, no, it was the Polish peasants who came after the Cossacks. I heard the Cossacks. And then I heard them. I was in the cellar. All of this in Yiddish. I'm sorry, I'm not telling it in Yiddish. The priest got up and made a sermon that Sunday. And would you believe it? Baba's silver candlesticks came back to her and her linens. I inherited the candlesticks. When my daughter was to marry, I went to a very wonderful silver um, restorer, and he repaired them. They were dented, bent, hollow, Polish, mid-19th century, typical Polish silver candlesticks. He repaired them, and he filled them, and I gave them to my daughter, Miriam. She has them to this day. So it was really amazing for me, you know, coming as a student of literature My mother. and history uh, to start to hear firsthand accounts of a world that I had only read about in, in books. Um, and so I want to show you next a, a clip from the esteemed uh, scholar, translator, and a Yiddish poet himself, um, Binyamin Harshav. Um, he grew up in Vilna, which was a very important center of Jewish learning um, and a place that I had read about um, extensively um, and studied the poets, the Yiddish poets of that city. And so um, this sort of represents for me the beginning of starting to hear these precious firsthand accounts um, and, and having the honor to record them myself. When I was a year old, I was a class from folklore literature. I was a young man, I was a young man, I was a young man, I was a fish mark. And I was a fish mark, I was a fish mark, I was a fish mark, I was a mit der Kaffee und, und das, das ich dann als Fischmark. Ich sage von Fischmark, die Sitzerkäse auf sie geht. Das ist ein Winter, dann haben sie gehabt, als sie in Ämer mit heißen Keulen und sie, sie haben untergeheben sehr äh, skirt, sehr, sehr, wie sagt man, und, und gesessen auf dem, auf dem heißen Top, der Feiertop und geschrieben, Gefeuerte Eperlach, verfeuerte Eperlach. Ich, das heißt, sie hat ver, verkauft Eperlach, was anscheinend ein bisschen verfeuern, ein bisschen, ich kann mir nehmen, weniger Geld. Es hat man uns geschickt dahin und wir haben gesehen, eine Idene, was ich gleich heim gerade auf Mame. Was ich gesehen habe, sie ist gleich ein Sitzer in den Markt und das ist gewesen für unsere Tassad Heim gerade. Der größte Poet. Is, uh, over here, uh, auf, auf dem Sof von dem Platz, ein bisschen auf dem Berg, ihr versteht, man geht von der Wanne, ist auf links ist dort der Gaona Museum und auf rechts Farm Museum ist gewesen der Markt. Dort ist ein uh, Café, ist, uh, ja, ist, wie macht man, wie kleidet man Folklore? Klolles. Ich frage mich, wir kommen zu sehr nun zu den zu die Fischerkästen, das wird verkauft Fisch. Und, und, und die Fischerkästen haben gemeint, wir gehen ganz mit dem Fisch. Und haben sie uns gejuckt. Und haben sie uns gejuckt, haben sie gesagt, klar, das verschiedene. Das ist das einzige klar, was ich verschrieben habe, was ich denke, ist, ich will machen von meiner Kischkäste ein Telefon. Der Schnur vom Telefon, da ist er doch mit Kischkes. Das ist ein Gewinn, das ich vor mir habe, gleich verschrieben. 
ist gewesen als erfolgsstimmige Kultur. So, um, some of the some of you may be familiar with some of these clips if you're on our email list or social media, or and if you're not, sign up. <laughs> Anyway, so um, pretty soon we realized that if we wanted to create a collection that was at all representative of Yiddish culture, we couldn't just sit in Western Massachusetts and wait for people to come to us. So we hit the road. Um, uh, we started attending conferences and festivals where people who cared about Yiddish gathered. Um, we went, of course, to New York quite frequently but not just New York. Um, one thing that this work has shown is that there are pockets of Yiddish culture in unexpected places. And this next clip that I'm gonna show you is sort of a, a staff favorite um, that represents Yiddish uh, being uh, discovered in unexpected places. Um, these two uh, cousins, Leonard Streer and Booney Dinner, um, Leonard Streer was a turkey farmer and Booney was a cattle rancher. Um, so in Colorado, um, so not necessarily where you would expect to find Yiddish culture. And yet here they are talking about their favorite Yiddish phrases. Azoi Gaitis. Yeah. Azoi Gaitis means that's the way it goes. I can. Uh, I would say that's one of my favorite. You can't use it. I, all right. Wurst then? It's a broken it's saint. What? What is? What's all? What's going on? With uh, broken it saint mean you speak? It's an idiom I get with talking through your teeth broken teeth and which means that you speak very little and very broken one saying my dad used to have if i wasn't busy is he said first kisten which is what are you doing they're practical questions first teach what are you doing and uh, and the other one is the same way. It's just, it's it's what you would ask in English almost. But it's a way. It's, of except it's something that you. It's a colloquialism you picked up from your parents, and uh, it stuck with you. That's all. And kind of a way of showing you're Jewish, I guess. Are you? So as the project developed and, and we got a little bit more funding, we were able to look beyond North America. Of course, you know, the, the Jewish diaspora um, is not just in North America um, by any means. And so we've had the privilege of being able to, and I'll say I have had the personal privilege of being able to um, do fieldwork trips abroad to start to document um, this, the global uh, story of Yiddish speakers, um, you know, from Eastern Europe, um, Yiddish speaking immigrants settled all over the world and brought Yiddish language and culture with them, setting up Yiddish institutions, um, newspapers, theaters, schools, um, pretty much wherever they went. So um, uh, we've now recorded interviews on, on six different continents um, and in Yiddish as well as many other languages. So um, that's been a real uh, exciting development in the project. And I think one that, that, that adds a lot of value to the collection as a whole. Um, you know, widening the lens to this uh, global perspective. So the next, um, the next clip I want to show you is, um, is a, a one that I love from a Hazen, a cantor, Leibel Hinnich, 
Um, and I want to give you a bit of backstory because it's very specific what he's um, talking about in the clip. So Leibola grew up in a Jewish agricultural colony. Um, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, there was a philanthropist, Baron de Hirsch, who um, wanted to do something to help the, uh, the Jewish population of the Russian Empire. And he saw and, and his perspective was that, you know, one of the things that re was really making it difficult for these people was the fact that many of them were not allowed to own land. So he bought some land in some, uh, in various places around the Americas, including in the Argentine Pampas, in rural Argentina, and set up Jewish agricultural colonies. So this next clip is um, Labela. We recorded this interview in Mexico City where Labela now lives, um, but he is singing about, he will tell you and sing about um, a Jewish agricultural colony called Moisesville, um, arguably the most famous of these um, Jewish agricultural colonies in Argentina. If I sing any Moses before I sing any, it's in me if I sing any, my stetel Moses we, Vista Yiddish Medina, Vista Stolz in Argentina, Moses we, Zet sich nieder ein in Bahn, Estacion La Croce, Dort in Zene nicht ging euer Faran, Nur in Blois Gor, Moshe Chayn, Chayet Boshe, in Argentina, we call it the leader of the Jewish state. And a clip like that also um, sort of represents one one of the values of these uh, oral histories. You know, people. It's a real delight when they break out in song or um, recite a poem from memory or tell um, a folk tradition from their family. And, you know, there's a term called salvage ethnography. And so in the oral histories themselves, there are these gems, these cultural artifacts that, you know, may otherwise may not have been recorded elsewhere. So, um, uh, you know, <laughs> we've found Yiddish in unexpected places, not just geographical, but also um, in in the the background of some people that you might not know had Yiddish in their background. So um, next, I'm just going to show you the uh, first half of a <laughs> short film that we made out of Leonard Nimoy's interview. Um, I can't, uh, you know, celebrate the project, I think, without showing our most popular, um, a, a portion from our most popular interview. Um, I don't think I need to introduce who Leonard Nimoy is. Um, and, and as I mentioned, this is just the first half of this short film. Um, you'll have to go onto our website or YouTube to watch the rest because we just don't have enough time. I also wanted to show this because it it was the very first um, foray we made into um, documentary film. And we're now seven years later about to release our first feature length documentary. So I wanted to pull that thread as well. So um, enjoy Leonard, also known as Leib in Yiddish, Nimoy. Sein or an sein. Or was the Frage? It is edle von Gemüt, was Frogen stellt, der Schleiderstein und Pfeil von Boys und Mazel, or is it bewaffen in Ankegen Jan von Leid und Endigen den Kampf? Hamlet. <laughs> My mishpacha comes from um, Russland, from Ukraine, a state was a event, um, Zaslav. My mother 
was brought out across the border into Poland under the hay, and the hay was snuck across the border. She and her mother, I guess. And my father snuck across the border on foot, someplace that was not patrolled carefully. So he walked across the border into Poland to get out of Russia. He went to Boston, and there he re-met my mother, who he knew from Zaslav, and that's where they were married. We lived in a, a very interesting uh, neighborhood. It was called the West End. It was about 60% Italian, and about 30, 25 or 30% Jewish, Yiddish-speaking Jews. The Italians spoke Yiddish, the Jews spoke Italian, some did. My friends were all a mix of Jews and Italians. We lived, second floor was Italian, third floor was, was Jewish. And you could tell who the occupants were by the smell of the food. <laughs> There's only one exact mention in, um, in the apartment. My Baba Zeta, my Tata Mama, and Ich bin mein Bruder. My Baba, but nine more gallant English. She could bake a challah that was beautiful. They made a brush from uh, turkey feathers, these big feathers that they dipped in the, um, in the egg batter and, and basted the, the challah with that. And she taught my mother how to do it. I remember that vividly. It came out golden brown. It was so beautiful. The challah was beautiful. My father's barber shop was within, I would say, 75 yards of where we lived. It was nicely outfitted. There were three chairs, although I don't ever remember the third chair being used. And maybe it was just in case business got so, so big that they would need a third barber. There was always a pinochle game going in the back room. When things got slow, that you could go in the back room and get in a card game. A little bit of gambling going on. My memory was that my dad had a reputation for being a pretty good card player. Haircuts, I think, were 25 cents. And a shave was a dime. And then I think by the time I left Boston, he was all the way up to 75 cents for a haircut. And a shave was probably a quarter. It was that kind of a, a business. This is a photograph of the grandfather, my, my maternal grandfather, my mother's father, Sam Spinner. You know, he believed in trying and going and doing. And there were often situations where I would declare some interest in something or other, and my parents would say, no, 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 he'd say, you go do it. Just go do it. Here, here's a dollar. Go do it. You know? <laughs> and he was uh, quietly supportive because he admired that sense of try, try something, try something, go out and do it. My mom and dad were extremely careful people. Everything they did was, was colored by fear. What could happen if you do this or that? So be safe. Just be safe. They, they didn't understand what Star Trek was all about. They just didn't get it, which I understood. It's not their cup of tea that they don't understand about science fiction, that whole milieu. What they knew was that I was making a good living. I was a, a success. They knew that. Kids would come around to my father's barbershop and ask for a Spock haircut. And he had a picture of me as Spock hanging on a mirror. So he, could, he gave them a bang cut. You know. Spock is an alien wherever he is, because he's not Vulcan and he's not human, he's half and half. He's a half-breed, what we used to call a half-breed, a mixed breed. Vulcan father, human mother. So he's not totally at home in the Vulcan culture, not totally accepted in the Vulcan culture because he's not totally Vulcan, certainly not totally accepted in the human culture because he's, he's part Vulcan. And that alienation was something that I had learned in Boston. I knew what it meant to be a member of a, of a minority, and in some cases, an outcast minority. So I understood that. I, I understood that aspect of the character, and I think it was helpful in playing it. So you can um, watch more of that online if you like. Um, I also, I, I want to show that because I think it gives a sense of, you know, the kinds of things that happen in these interviews, which I'm showing short clips today, but each interview is one to two hours long. And so though the focus is, uh, the central focus is on Yiddish, the interviews really explore many different aspects of Jewish identity, culture, and history. So as the project grew, we developed, we realized we were collecting um, interviews around 
certain topics. Um, and so we developed, we sort of went in various directions, developing series interview series around these particular topics, you know, so one was who studies Yiddish and why? And another one was sort of looking again every day as we enter the Yiddish book center, as I enter the Yiddish book center um, and, and anyone who works there knows, you know, or who has visited knows you're, you're flooded with that wonderful old book smell. So what are the stories behind these thousands of books on our shelves? In other words, who were all the people that wrote them? So um, we began to interview um, Yiddish writers, those that um, are still around, and there are some people still living who write in Yiddish, and their descendants. So this next clip is, uh, by, is from Henry Donau, who is um, a literary agent and whose father was a Yiddish journalist and writer, Moisha Dluzhnovsky. Um, so here we go. Uh, it, the uh, constant uh, sound in our home was uh, my father's typewriter, his little portable uh, Hermes Yiddish typewriter. It, it's a really cher cherished relic uh, in our home now because I so, so associate it with my father. We grew up in a very small apartment, a one-bedroom apartment uh, on West 71st Street. Uh, uh, my sister and I shared a bedroom. Uh, my parents slept on a convertible sofa in the living room, which was also uh, de facto my father's office. Um, so he had a desk in the corner, and uh, whatever was going on in the house at any given time, whether Esty and I were watching Popeye the Salomon on TV or uh, quarreling with each other, as brothers and sisters always used to do, um, there would be the sound of my father's clopping on the Yiddish typewriter. Um, he, he would write with one finger like this. Um, and he was very, very fast. Uh, so uh, when did he write? My feeling was he always was writing. Uh, there, there were no uh, office hours observed. Uh, he was likely to be writing uh, in the evening as, as during the day. Um, just pecking away at that at that typewriter. Uh, so going back to sort of the big questions that we we're trying to answer um, uh, through these oral histories, one is where is Yiddish, you know, in the world today, and um, how is Yiddish a part of Jewish art today? Um, Yiddish can be heard and perhaps, you know, arguably the most um, widespread place that uh, people will encounter Yiddish is through Jewish music, through klezmer music. Um, so we have a number of interviews in our collection about um, Yiddish, uh, Yiddish music, folk music, and klezmer. So I'll show you next um, a favorite from that series. So Theo Bacall, um sure is familiar to many of you. Um, perhaps you grew up with his records in your home. Um, Theo really was a carrier of Yiddish culture and particularly Yiddish folk song in, um, in the second half of the 20th century. Um the given a moment in women irchot gesagt ich will um singen jiddish music so der beschlussig wenn sehr leicht weil ich bin gerührt geworden als bi als ihr bin wenn der 91 er was hat er nomen und erkennes das heißt Ich habe auch Häufer schuld, ich muss es tun. Die, das, was ich habe, es lieb zu tun, ist eine andere Sache. No, ich muss es Tage tun, weil auf meine Plätze hat, hat man immer gelost etwas. Ich habe gesagt, gerade von den Nazis. 
הוא נחפק זכתומת פרווס. פרווס. פרווס בנכדו, אנדרי זה נן הונדרטר, טויזנדר מיליונן, זה נן אומגקומן אינדר שואה, וניר זיצדו נחלק לב. נו, ווסט את הצווק פון לב, מיין לב, פון מיין לב. פרווס את ממיר בזונדר, הרויז גקליבן, אז יחזור בלייבן לבן. טרכטר, אפשר מלחפשתין מדיהם, מדיהם לבן מלחפש אופטון. ווסט כן, ווסט סובך, די מיטלן, ווסט מיטגיגב מיטלן. ‫נישט צו ארבעטן מיט די הנט, ‫נישט צו ארבעטן מיט די בודן, ‫נאר צו ארבעטן מיט די קופ, ‫מיט די קול, מיט די שטימה, ‫מיט די מגליכקייט צו שרייבן, ‫צו פרטייטשן, צו איברזצן ‫פון אין לושן אופן אנדרן, ‫צו גיבן מנשן, ‫וואס בכלל קנה נישט, ‫וייסן נישט, פון ידן. ‫כן, זה וייזן, ‫דוס בילד פון מיינה ידן. ‫ודוס בילד איז במיר אין גזאנג, ‫דוס בילד איז במיר אין דפואזיה, ‫דוס בילד איבר דם, ‫בילד כמן ליינן, כמן שרייבן, ‫כמן זינגן. ‫ודוס טויך. So another, um, you know, sub uh, part or seg segment of the collection is um, Yiddish theater. Um, there's a rich history of Yiddish theater. And um, so we began collecting stories of the Yiddish theater. And on the screen right now are some also some of the Uh, artifacts that we collected along with the oral histories. I wanted to mention that um, because of a, thanks to a recent uh, project funded in part by the National Endowment for the Humanities, um, we've now been able to put these visual materials um, on our website as well, along with the oral histories. And um, as you can see, even just each one of these that is on the screen has a whole um, story behind it. So it adds a lot to the collection. Um, so the next uh, clip I want to show you is from a wonderful actress, um, Yiddish actress, Leia Schlanger. Um, she, uh, I interviewed her in Tel Aviv um, and where she, you know, still is, is a force in the Yiddish world there. She actually um, began her career um, on the Yiddish stage in, in Eastern Europe, in Poland, um, and uh, was quite a sensation there in, at the Ida Kaminska Theater in the years after the Second World War. Um, and in this clip, she's talking about one of the great uh, Yiddish actors that she worked with in Israel in the later part of her life. Um, and uh, his name is Joseph Buloff, Yosef Buloff. And I just want to mention uh, that there's a funny typo in the subtitle of this video. Um, you know, it happens. But the, the play that she is referring to is The Death of a Salesman. Um, you'll see sort of the, there's the Yiddish word for salesman um, made it into the subtitle rather than the English word. So anyway, here she is. I have learned from Bulov and Zerasach. Zerasach. And not only I, I know that the Mirum has played the most of the toys from Avoyashor. זה ננק, עוד מן אינדר זלבר צייד גשפית אין הבימה, מיד גרויס אקטיור, מסקין, ונורובינה, ונוחה זלחה. ונזה הום גיהת הטוק פריי, פלגן זה קימן, זיץ נינדר אשתרי, ונקיק מידו פורשטל, ונטלרנן פונבולו. יכו בגילאי הנתפונים תיאטר, צו שפיל, יכו בגילאי הנתפונים צוגין צו דרול ארנסט, אפלק מירזוגן. Du weißt, ich habe über die Schule tausendmal. Tausendmal, wenn ich ein bisschen 
איברג, איברג, וי זאת אומרת, ריכטיק, או בהונדרט מור גלויביך. ואל דר זה קור זיינר, נישט גוון אזו איגוט. ונא רוד גימיסטה סך לרנן. ונא פלקטון זוגן ואל אין ישראל. ונא רוד גשפילט ואל גאד דם אנסמבל זה נגוון אקטורים פון פועל. זה נגוון אקטורים פון רומניה. פון פועל נוט מגרת האנדרש ופון רומניה נוט מגרת האנדרש. ונא רוד גרת מתא וולינר וולינר שפרח. מר ויניקר ויחרת. אבו לינר דיאלקט. ואיר פלגט זוג איר דף צריך איבר דרין דם די צינק אוי פיידיש. ואיר זה פלגט צווישן זיכר אדן רומייניש. ונאנדר פלגט צווישן זיכר אדן פוילש. תרגיש זוג מיר דף איבר דרין די צינק אוי פיידיש. Oral history isn't journalism, but we are continuing to document as Yiddish shows up in new spaces in the 21st century. Um, in recent years, Yiddish has shown up on Broadway, in web series, on TV, um, all over the place. So um, we are continuing to document that. And while many of the clips I've shown today sort of paints Yiddish as a culture of the past, and it is true that for some people Yiddish is a culture of the past, Yiddish culture did survive the Holocaust, assimilation, and the other forces that were stacked against it in the 20th century. And Yiddish is still a spoken language. So I wanted to show this one clip of someone for whom uh, Yiddish is very much still a living language and a language in his family. This is my natürlich. My friend learned Japanese with the children, and was famous. First, he was the only one who was in America. He had his mom in Tokyo, and his brother and sister. And the things are very special. And that is, in Canada, in Canada, in Canada. Das heißt, dass die Kinder unzuhalten Kontakt mit dem Spruch in Japan und gemischt reden Japanisch. In ich habe ich bald von Anfang erkannt, dass sie zu kennen Japanisch ist, ist gar nicht eine schlechte Sache. Hat der Kyoko von Anfang an <coughs> geredet Japanisch mit sich. Wir sind aufgewachsen, reden die Japanisch. Aber meine Seite habe ich gefragt mir ja. Es ist schon gut, wenn sie sagen, sie reden Japanisch, Englisch wollen sie auch weiter reden für die Schule. Also wie ich bin auch weg in den Kindergarten, habe ich gelernt Englisch, aber in der Heimat habe ich gelernt nur Jiddisch. Aber ich habe gefragt, ja, amerikanische Kinder sehen sie, in Japanisch lernen sie, wo es Gewicht hat sie, gar nicht. Aber ich habe gefragt, dass ich, als ich, ich als geben Jiddisch gebe. Aber ich von Anfang an gerät Jiddisch mit sie. In von Anfang an, wie ich schon gesagt habe, Kyoko gerät Japanisch mit sich. Wir sind aufgewachsen, zwei, zweisprachig, und gerät beide Sprachen. Zum Versehen ist es gemein natürlich, also der Vater redet eine Sprache, der Mann redet eine andere Sprache. So, I wish I could spend all day showing you clips, but, um, and I'll say it was really hard to choose just a few clips to try to represent this collection for you all today. Um, but I want to, um, you know, show you just one last clip that I think um, just a nod to the fact that the story isn't over with Yiddish. So here we have a wonderful performer, playwright, director, Eleanor Risa, um, and uh, she, references at the beginning the fact that this interview was recorded at CLES Canada, which is a annual um, uh, sort of festival workshop um, in uh, the Laurentian Mountains in Quebec, um, all about uh, Yiddish culture, Ashkenazi Jewish culture. Well, I mean, here we are in CLES Canada, and I don't know if I've ever seen so many young people in, a, in this kind of Yiddish, Jewish, cultural situation. So um, 
it's sort of, it's very exciting, it's very thrilling. Um, and I think there is a, re I mean, I think there is a revival. I don't know how big it is. I don't know what's going to happen to it. But, but there's a lot of groovy people who are speaking Yiddish now, and it kind of ain't your bubba's Yiddish anymore. People, there's a lot of new work, new songs in Yiddish, and they're good. And they're written by contemporaries of mine and younger people than me. And uh, most of the people here are now younger than me. And well, it's like a fee, you know, Yiddish is like, it's like a fever, really. And if you, if you can contaminate somebody with a Yiddish fever, uh, you can sort of. I feel like it's, you can really turn people on. Uh, and I, I mean, that's kind of what I want to do. And it turns me, you know, it turns me on. Um, so uh, it's, it's a communicative, it's the most expressive language. I, I mean, I hate when people say that, but it's the most expressive language I know. Uh, let's put it that way. Maybe there, there are a plethora of others that are also, but the notion of its diminutive qualities and its, poeticness and its onomatopoeic qualities and you know I mean Michael Wex is the guy to talk to m more about that but I feel like I own the language and I think that's pe I, there's something about um, people want it I don't know they want it they want to they want to be be able to speak it so I think something's ha you know something's happening here I think the music has really turned people on, and it's really inclusive. Uh, it's really inclusive. So if you can start to learn how to express yourself, who doesn't want to do that? And Yiddish is so expressive that, I mean, if you can do it in Yiddish, you know, do it. So I think it's 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 a it's a hopeful it's a hopeful situation for the future, but it's a, an exciting situation for the present. It's it's really uh, fun now to see it like bubble and live, and that it's not it's not it's not just for a generation that's exiting. Well, before we um, wrap up here and go to questions, I just want to repeat again my thanks for the people who have supported the work and the people who have done the work over the last now almost 11 years. There have been so, I've had the honor of working with so many amazing people, interns, videographers, fellows, um, colleagues, uh, video editors, translators um, and that has been a real um, personal gift to me to get to know so many wonderful people through this work so um, I want to thank all of you and um, encourage uh, all of you if you're interested in what you've seen today you know there are about 4,000 more clips like this <laughs> on our website and on YouTube and uh, 1500 hours of oral histories in the collection now. So I encourage you to um, go explore. Um, and I think now, Susan, we can go to questions. Okay, I'm glad to be back. Uh, Krista, I just wanna say again, congratulations to you, Shakoya. It's incredible what you've accomplished. I don't think we really could not have imagined what this program was going to become. I've now been at the Yiddish Book Center about 10 and a half years. And, I, you know, I've sort of seen it from very early stages. And I think it's, it's, it's really remarkable. And clearly, you know, not only is it an incredible resource, it's sort of a love letter to Yiddish and the people who lived it and live it. And it's quite moving. I feel I could watch these clips for days. But anyway, let's go on to take a few questions. There have been, a, there are a few of them that have come up. Um, you know, first of all, and I think this is a really 
a lovely question to ask. And I think I'm sure, uh, you know, many people have asked this question of you, Krista, but what brought you to Yiddish and what brought you to the Yiddish Book Center? Yeah, um, well, so as many of you know, I did not grow up with Yiddish. I'm not Jewish. And um, so, so my story is that I encountered Yiddish uh, while studying um, at Smith College. Um, I was studying history and comparative literature. Um, and so I came across Yiddish in a literature class um, first uh, in translation. And then, um, you know, I had the fortune of being just down the road from the Yiddish Book Center. So I took a course at the Yiddish Book Center. Um, I did the internship program, now the Steiner Summer Yiddish program. Once I began learning the language and seeing that, you know, I was just touching the tip of a huge iceberg that, uh, you know, there I could spend years um, learning about Yiddish culture, I sort of fell into that uh, rabbit hole and I've been there ever since. And we're luckier for it. <laughs> um, so since this is only the tiniest taste and you, you allude to all of the, um, all of the interviews on uh, that, that people can access, you know, what, how, I mean, I, can you tell people how they can search? I know we, we just did a, a little video that explains it, but tell people the different ways that they can explore it in short, obviously. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> so um, if you want to, uh, the, the entire collection is, well, what we've processed and, and uploaded so far over 800 interviews are available on yiddishbookcenter.org. If you um, look under uh, digital collections, you'll get to the oral history collection. Um, you can also just uh, type something into the general search and you'll be able to um, find uh, materials in our various collections, including the oral history collection. And, and another great way to sort of get more familiar with the project is to follow um, the social media for the project or sign up for our emailer. Um, we, we highlight uh, sort of what I've, like what I've done today, um, we, we put highlights out regularly. So that's another way to get into the collection. Great. Um, here's an interesting one. Someone asks whether we have interviews with people from Sephardic and Mizrahi background that also have sort of a Yiddish crossover. And if so, are they available on the website? Yeah, we, um, we do have uh, a, a few interviews with people who have both Sephardi and Ashkenazi um, background. Um, and those, I'm trying to think, the one of them is relatively recent, so I'm not sure it's up on the website yet, but you could, um, you could search. Again, we have quite, we've done quite a bit of work with the metadata and the keywords. So once you're on our collection, you can search for that or any other, um, other topic of interest and, and what, and it should come up. And you can always email us if you're curious, do you have an interview about X, Y, or Z? We're happy to point you to what's in the collection. Great. Um... Here's another one. So when you're traveling and doing these interviews in non-English speaking countries, obviously the interviews in Yiddish, uh, you and some other of our interviewers speak Yiddish. Um, how do you handle the interviewing in these different languages? Do you bring translators or, you know, we, one thing that didn't really come up is that we have field fellows. These are our um, people who have been trained by us. Often they've been our fellows at the Yiddish Book Center and they've been trained by us and they, they, they are either natives of or living in countries around the world and speak those languages. But maybe you wanna say something about that. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so um, uh, uh, among our team, we have you know, many different languages um, among the, the team of oral historians that we have working on the project. And so, we don't work with translators except for a couple of situations where, you know, we realized once we got into an interview that, you know, someone's Yiddish wasn't quite good enough. Maybe we would bring in uh, someone to help, but generally 
um, we we work directly in in the languages and and uh, you you know pair an oral historian who knows the language with the narrator um, um, their preference of language um, and when we travel you know um, yeah we're connecting with Yiddish speakers but also trying to have the oral historians who are familiar with the local language do that work. Great. And this, I guess it's a sort of a related question, but how do you find your subjects? Who do you decide to interview and, and where do they come from? Yeah, well, there are various ways that we get connected to people. So we do have on our website a, um, a place where anyone can fill out a pre-interview questionnaire if they are interested in being interviewed and or someone that they know. Um, so that's been actually a way that we've found out about many people, but um, the Yiddish Book Center, um, it, I've been fortunate to draw on our vast network of knowledge of the Yiddish uh, speaking uh, world and the Yiddish cultural world. So we've had a lot of connections that have come that way. And you know, also once you interview one person, there are connections to other people. So sort of a combination of all of those things um, uh, lead to how we, how we choose people. Yeah. So that's to say that if any of you have people that you really feel that we shouldn't miss, please send, send their names our way and, and we'll do our best to follow up. Um, so a few more questions. Uh, this is an interesting one. It relates to, the, to Eleanor Reyes's clip about uh, people speaking Yiddish today and Yiddish as a vibrant culture today. Um, one person asks, um, are, have we interviewed people who are raising their children in Yiddish today uh, that are not Hasidic? And I know I know the answer to that, but I'll let you mm -hmm. say a few words about it. Yes, certainly. Um, that is sort of one of the 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 topics that we've explored in in a, a smaller interview series, um, and that is there are people. Um, we saw the clip from Fred um, talking about the decision to you know raise his kids in Yiddish. And we have a number of interviews with people who have, um, for whom that's been an important decision um, in their, in their, um, in their own families. And we're, and, you know, we're starting to interview some people who even grew up in those, in those families as well. And have you interviewed, do you, have we interviewed anybody in the Hasidic communities themselves? Yeah, well, we have done a little bit of work. Um, I've, uh, you know, I think it, we have done some work, particularly um, the work that we've uh, collaborated with Hank Isnetsky on to interview some musicians from the Hasidic world. That's something that I'm curious to try to do more of in the future. There are specific challenges in terms of access and, you know, really is a different uh, culture um, so we haven't done too much of that. Really, the focus is Yiddish outside of that community, but we do have a several interviews in the collection um, from that community. Another question relates to the use of the material. Uh, somebody notes that that, that there's, there's a treasure trove of educational material in the connection in the collection, and wonders whether there's a plan to partner with or create on our own units or modules for teachers to use. I'll just say that we already use a lot of these materials across the work that we do at the Yiddish Book Center in our teaching pro te programs for teachers and and in our Yiddish language instruction. But Krista, maybe you want to say a couple more words about that. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's been so gratifying is seeing how, you know, our efforts to make these um, interviews accessible has allowed people to start using them right away. So, um, so we've heard about uses in museums and as you mentioned in Yiddish classrooms, also classrooms on many different topics. So that is something that we're, we're thinking about um, exploring different options. I mean, one way that the Yiddish Book Center already uses it is in our Teach Great Jewish Books program, where we have mo teaching modules um, about a particular text. Um, and uh, there are some connections, some places where we've used oral history in that way. 
Um, so I think we'll see, you know, that's something that I know, Susan, you and I have talked about for many years. Um, it's always a competition of where to put our focus, but I think that's certainly something that, um, that we're looking to explore in the future. Absolutely. I think we felt too that collection was the primary and the first objective. And of course, there'll be there are many, many opportunities for us and for others to use the, the interviews in, in all sorts of ways, including in classrooms. So I'm just going to ask one final question that is sort of uh, a two part question. First of all, um, you know, we know we've been inter we've been interviewing remotely since the pandemic began, which is really wonderful because we've been able to keep this going, even though it's not the same as being in person. We've at least been able to capture some interviews that perhaps can't wait. But what 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 countries are on your list to go next when we're able to travel again? That's that's sort of the first part of the, the question. And the other part is a broader one related to the, the the legacy of the project and sort of the what's next in a, you know, so we're we're 10 years in. How do you see the next 10 years unfolding for the project? Well, we, you know, you mentioned that. That we talked earlier about uh, how we find the names of people that we're interested in interviewing. We have a vast list of hundreds of names of people that we're eager to interview, so there's plenty of work left to do just in collecting. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, also, you know, we're seeing, you know, in the last decade, the story has evolved. So there are new things to document as you know, Yiddish shows up in new places and evolves and, and takes on new um, spaces in the world. Um, wow, thinking about travel, that seems like a lifetime ago, but I don't know when I'm going to be ready to get on a plane. But, um, you know, there are the way that I look at this is, you know, again, at this point, trying to think about what we have in the collection and identifying areas of um, where we have fewer interviews. So um, trying to fill in some of the gaps or areas where we have less. Um, so actually, um, uh, you know, looking in terms of where to go, there are centers of Yiddish culture that we don't have as much from. Some of the places on the list are, you know, actually in Western Europe, partnering with some institutions in Paris. Um, we were in London most pretty recently, but um, South Africa, uh, you know, we've done some trips in Australia and um, Latin America, but there are more, more stories in those places. So really there, there's a long list, a long wish list of, of places and people to interview that, um, that will keep us busy for several more years at least. <laughs> okay, I think on that note, knowing that a lot lies ahead of us, uh, we're thrilled to celebrate an incredible decade, incredible first 10 years, an, an amazing resource. Uh, just, I think you could just spend hours just just diving into these. And as a historian, I, I, I can only imagine what this will be like for historians in 50 years to be able to watch these as they're doing their research. It's just an incredible resource. So thank you and congratulations and thank you all. I'm gonna wrap up by thanking everyone for being part of with us this today and, and thank our producer, Sarah Bleichfeld, who does all the work behind the scenes to make this possible. Today's event is part of an ongoing series of programs brought to you live from the center, such as it is. Join us this Thursday, December 17th at 7 p.m. Eastern for How Folkways Records Planted the Seeds of the Yiddish Renaissance, a apt topic given our, given our presentation today, and that's with Hank Isnetsky. And to see the full schedule of events and to register for our programs, visit yiddishbookcenter.org slash events. Thanks to our members whose support makes all of our ongoing work possible. All of us at the Yiddish Book Center are working as hard as we can to keep Yiddish and Jewish culture alive in the midst of a global pandemic. But we need your support now more than ever. If you want to help us continue our crucial work, please make your tax deductible contribution at yiddishbookcenter.org donate. Thank you again and have a great day. Bye-bye.